Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had the, a nice day so far. My name is Federica. I work uh, at the Linux Foundation Europe as a communication and marketing manager. And now starts one of my favorite parts, which is giving the spotlight to project and their communities. I'm going to be very fast because uh, I really want them to explain themselves and, so, and moreover, the updates on these projects. So I'm going to start with the first one, which is presented by Lucian Balea. It's going to present LF Energy. Please, an applause for Lucian. For uh, those uh, I haven't met yet, so I'm Lucian Balea. I'm with RT, the power transmission system operator in France. And I'm here also as chair of the board of LF Energy. LF Energy is not an Elf Europe project, but it is, is a foundation that has strong roots in Europe. And uh, it's a great illustration about this local global uh, collaboration, I think. Um, so actually, I do not need to say much about like the uh, Elf Energy's mission and their importance. Why that? Because, um, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, Mother Earth takes care of that. If we look uh, just a few days uh, ago, uh, Central Europe was Central Europe was hit by um, dramatic floodings, uh, and uh, many of you here had uh, an experience, uh, <laughs> a, a flavor of it live. So, so you you know what it means, and. Um, if you look at the IPCC reports for uh, some years, some time now, they, they, they are predicting that uh, these kind of uh, events and consequences of climate change, unfortunately, they will worsen in the, the future. So that's, that's for sure. Uh, we know that it will worsen, but the extent to which it will worsen will also depend on the uh, actions that we are urg urgently taking uh, in the coming years to, to tackle this problem. So all this to introduce our mission at LF Energy. It's a, it's a clear mission. We are gathering all the concerned organizations to collaboratively speed up the development of the needed uh, technologies to uh, achieve our dec decarbonization and uh, energy transition uh, goals. In terms of members uh, at LF Energy, so this is illustrated uh, with this uh, colorful uh, landscape. We have a diversity of um, both uh, utilities, uh, energy uh, generator, energy producers, uh, tech companies, IT service companies, academia, and uh, public institutions. And we are growing. That's great news. We are growing. We now have over 75 members. We are uh, hosting uh, over 30, 30 projects. So the same colorful landscape with our project logos. Um, OK, but like building the vibrant community that we need to pursue our mission is not just gathering um, logo, uh, member logos or, or, or project logos. It's it's a bit more complex like, uh, than that, actually. It's a complex uh, recipe of, uh, of people, of knowledge, and of right practices. And that's what we are doing at LF Energy. So let's start uh, with knowledge. Um, LF Energy contributed to growing knowledge through the publication of four important reports this year. Briefly, the first one, cybersecurity in energy, uh, in energy infrastructure, highlights how open source can help transforming the energy infrastructure and what needs to be done to tackle this security uh, challenge seriously through best practices. Our annual report provides some insights on concrete achievements towards our mission, and then the Software Defined vert Vertical Industry Transformation Report. It shows how uh, vertical industries are becoming more software defined through leverage of open source technologies and uh, what kind of lessons the energy industry can 
take out of, uh, out of this. And then the, our most recent uh, report, Open Source and Energy Interoperability, thanks to LF Research. Um, in this report, we are analyzing how open source can solve the interoperability issue in the energy industry, especially considering that we'll have to cope with the more distributed energy resources. And uh, this study was made in the context of the Canadian um, grid, so like global perspective. Then, then if we go to um, best practices, we are a critical infrastructure, and I can tell that we are tackling the security challenge head on. So to, to do that, LF Energy partner with the open, uh, the open source uh, technology improvement fund to run security audits for two projects, namely CPAS and, and Operator Fabric. These security, these were holistic uh, se security audits, they identified uh, actionable vulnerabilities which have been addressed by the concerned projects and even in, in some cases they have been escalated and addressed by the upstream uh, open source projects. So based on this successful experience we will do more of that in the coming years and we, uh, we will also focus on the projects with the highest adoption. Last and not least, people. Um, actually, this year was quite prolific in terms of gatherings, in terms of events. Uh, earlier this month, we had our annual summit in Brussels. This was a complete success. It was sold out. We, we had five tracks. We, we had the live demos. We had uh, hands-on workshops. So yeah, great, great event. And uh, I expect that uh, you, 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 you can see the the energy that, that was at the event uh, that shines through those, uh, the few photos that we are displaying here. But yeah, that was not the only, only event. We also had the first of its kind open source, uh, sus open sustainability policy summit hosted by Johns Hopkins in, um, in Washington DC where government, uh, where uh, academia, where industry gathered to discuss open source for uh, energy and climate. And we also had the first of its kind open EV charging summit hosted by Texas Instruments in Dallas, where automakers, charging manufacturers, government, and other stakeholders gather to, to discuss how open source can improve reliability and interoperability for EV charging stations. Um, so now I want to spend a few minutes left on impact because this is what matters in the end, right? Um, so how has LF Energy concretely contributed to the, uh, to the energy transformation, uh, energy transition needs? First, speaking about EV charging, LF Energy partnered with the US Joint Office of Energy and Transportation Departments to leverage one of our projects called Everest, and actually this project was born in, in Europe here, to leverage this project to improve, to, to, to foster interoperability for uh, EV charging station in the United States. In a completely different uh, area, our carbon data specification that is part of uh, LF Energy Standards and Specification Initiative has reached an important milestone. They have published their first draft of specifications. This specification aim at helping organizations to measure their carbon footprint through their power consumption. Maybe I will skip those two to go fast. Uh, of course, this is what matters the most for RT, like seeing that some software projects are delivering uh, uh, solutions that are put into production uh, at several uh, power grid utilities, but maybe I will not go into the details because that's maybe not what talks the most to you. I want to, to focus on this impact that is 
very important to us. So during our summit in Brussels two weeks ago, Mark van Stiput, who is deputy head of research, innovation, and digitalization at the DG Energy from the European Commission, made a keynote. And that's what he's saying. So we are not investing in research and innovation for the sake of investing in research and innovation. It needs to lead to innovation that make a difference in the real world and contribute to the energy transition. We think that projects that use open source have basically a head start when it comes to deployment in the market. So having reached this kind of awareness at the policy level in Europe is really a, a great milestone uh, to us, a very important milestone to us. Now, this being said, we have some achievements, but uh, achieving decarbonization of our energy systems and globally is a huge task. So we still have a lot of work to do. We still need more members. We still need more projects to fill in the gaps in our landscape. We need more developers to contribute code. So if you feel compelled by what we are doing here, do not hesitate, join us, and you will be warmly welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucian. I'm going to go faster to the second uh, presentation, which is going to be the, done by Preston Lau from the Open Mobile Hub project. Thank you, Federico. So before I begin the presentation, maybe let me give you an introduction about myself. So I am a founder for this Open Mobile Hub project, and I used to work for Google and Qualcomm company. And something interesting I just found out yesterday. Actually, I worked in the same company as Annie many years ago. <laughs> you, know, you, you basically told the cloud I was in your section. Uh, the company is called Sun Microsystem. Actually, anybody heard about this company? <laughs> Okay, that review your age, basically. Okay. <laughs> so um, I think one of the th main things that I've been in this uh, tech industry, mobile industry, for many years. So I basically saw app developers are facing two major challenges when developing the apps. One of them is making sure the apps consistently behave across different devices. And the second, they want to develop once. Develop once that they can run the apps on multiple ecosystems. So you know, one of the you know, major problems that everybody see um, is fragmentation. When you look at you know, all the operating systems for mobile devices in the market today, obviously you have Android, uh, which is done by Google, and they open source it, which, which is called AOSP. And one is open source. There's a lot of branches out there that basically leverage open source, develop their own version. And of course, there's a big player out there, which is the iOS, Apple, and uh, Huawei, uh, Harmony OS next as well. So trying to make the apps runs on all these different ecosystems and devices is very difficult, very challenging. So what they actually done is they're making some assumptions. They're assuming that when they develop the apps, maybe the Google mobile services, GMS services is actually present. But however, there's still a lot of devices out there who actually does not have the GMS library uh, embedded. So devices, a lot of them from China, for example, uh, Amazon, um, uh, Fire OS also does not have GMS devices. Uh, we also talked to uh, Meta and their MetaQuest, the VR headset based on AOSP. They also does not have GMS library on it. So they basically have all these devices, all these users are facing a problem. So what are the problems they're facing? So for it, you know, common is the error messages pop up saying, hey, Google Play services, which is actually not there. I cannot run, continue running this app on this device. And sometimes, um, in this case, the app integrated with Google Drive. Uh, the user trying to click on it, but there's no response. What's going on? There's no error messages, nothing. There's just no response. Uh, the reason is GMS library is missing. And people are also trying to pay using uh, Google IEP, which is also not functioning. So these are some of the common issues that the end user are facing. Of course, from the app developer perspective, they don't want to see that happen. Uh, this creates a lot of frustrations. But look, looking at also at the market today, I mean, you have all these different type of devices out there. Uh, I'm sure if you pull out your phone in this room, you know, everybody have a different type of brand that they use. But I think the good thing is, um, we actually categorize it maybe in four categories. It's actually maybe easier to understand. Android with a GMS library on it, Android without GMS, 
Apple iOS, and also other OS like uh, uh, Huawei uh, Harmony OS Next. So how how this project able to help them? So when I first started this project about two years ago, I envisioned that this is going to be a project that could actually help solve these two major challenges from the apps developer. How? So the way we actually do this is we encourage developers to integrate OMH within their apps. When the apps is fully integrated with the OMH, at runtime, OMH will actually de determine what kind of devices this is. Does it actually have GMS library on it? Uh, of course, if the device has GMS library on it, um, OMH will basically just pass it through. Okay, can you help service this request from this end user? However, if the device actually missing the GMS library, what we will do is we'll implement an alternative way of fulfilling the request. So how? Um, we're actually using other means, not using the library on the device, but actually using the web. Like for example, the Google Authentication Web API, the Google Drive web-based API, and we try to make sure that the end user experience is consistent, even the device of GMS or without GMS, it still looks the same way to the end user. So that is basically saving the app developer a lot of efforts. So they don't need to worry about all those, they just need to worry about integrating with OMH. I think, of course, multiple OS uh, support, and most importantly, it's a plugin architecture. So the way we support all these service providers is basically offering a plugin architecture that different third-party services can easily also support it uh, by the uh, developer. So I think one of the things that uh, I also learned before lunch, there's a panel discussion talking about giving choices, giving selections. I think this is one of the also objective for OMH is to give developer choices. They can integrate, they can integrate, they can actually use Google services as part of OMH, or they can just make a very small switch and switch to Microsoft, or switch to Meta, or Facebook, or uh, Dropbox, and some, other, some of these other services. So make it very, very easy for them to migrate and switch. So the benefits, why the app developer will be interested? Of course, the open mobile ecosystem, give them choices, give them selections, give them flexibility to switch. And of course, all the benefit comes with open source. The entire project is open source under GitHub, so anybody can see it, anybody can contribute and look all the benefit from open source. I think most importantly is the global reach. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of these devices, for example, a lot of devices in, from China and MetaQuest and also Fire OS, all, the, all these devices, all these users will be able to enjoy the same services, uh, similar to other you know, GMS-supported devices. So much bigger global user reach. So what we have done so far, um, so two years ago we started this project and last year we successfully launched um, the first version OMH 1.0 um, and actually contained three major features, lock and authentication, maps, and storage. And actually just like 10 days ago, I was at, um, I was at the uh, React Universe conference in Poland, so I presented this to the audience and announcing also that OMH 2.0 was released on the same day which supports React Native, uh, cross-platform support, supporting iOS devices, and a lot of the additional plugin as well uh, that we offer as part of the uh, initial package. And then we also, as part of the uh, TSC uh, meeting, we also talk about what are the features that people actually ask for. Uh, that, that, those are the features that we have uh, planned in our, in our roadmap in the future. Mobile ads, in a payment, app security, for example, Flutter support, which is very important as well, and Expo SDK. So, Looking at the plugin, as I said earlier, the plugin architecture is very, very important. It's the core for the OMX project. So what we have done is we developed the OMX uh, map services supporting Google Maps, Azure Map from Microsoft, Mapbox, OpenStreetMap, and Apple Maps. And for authentication, we support Google, Microsoft, Facebook, or Meta, and Dropbox. And finally, the storage, we support uh, Google Drive. OneDrive and Dropbox. These are just the ones that we develop as part of 2.0, but of course there's a lot of other service providers out there that's not supported initially. So what we, uh, we are so glad that this project is now part of the much bigger open source uh, community and then we actually encourage a lot of the open source community members to contribute to the project by adding additional plugin support for more services. Like authentication, there are probably like 100 different services that can do authentication. We can't do it all by ourselves, so we have to rely on the open source community to do it. This is the perfect opportunity for open source collaborations. So we have done some integration with some partners. Uh, see, here are some examples. So we've done integration with uh, Signal and also Expensify. So you can see on the left side of the animation, 
uh, when the use when the user for for the signal app for messaging trying to send their map location, there's error message missing you know uh, missing Google Play services uh, when they run it on a non GMS devices, and the user don't know what to do. I, you know I, you know there's also very user unfriendly. After integration with OMH, you can see the uh, user can share the location, the map showing up. The user experience is consistent with the devices with the GMS. And similarly, for the Expensify apps, um, with the GMS integration, people can submit their expenses and also can pinpoint that in the map. So these are some of the real-life examples with the partner integration. And this is the last slide to talk about the TSC um, committee. So I'm the chairperson for the TSC meeting. So we define the roadmap every month, the first Wednesday or every month. And it's open for all. So if you are interested to learn more about what we are doing, what we are planning, and you have some great ideas you want to share, please join us in the next TSC meeting. And also, you can go to the website um, to check out more uh, on uh, GitHub. And then before I end the presentation, one thing I want to highlight. Uh, we transferred the project to Linear Foundation Europe about six months ago, and since then we have a lot of great support from them. Gabe, and also the team there, Esther, Federica, my, uh, my Wooster, Milko, and a lot of other extended team uh, from the creative services, helping us to create the logo <laughs> and making some of these t-shirts. Um, and also the webinar, there's one coming up in uh, next month. Please join us there. Uh, one thing is, unfortunately, <laughs> we ship a box of uh, T-shirts here, but it's not arrived yet. <laughs> We're supposed to give out to you guys. So. <laughs> but, was, but one thing is really, um, I'm, I think this is probably the best decision we made, transferring the project to the Foundation Europe. So much support, all the interest coming from the community. And uh, please join me, you know, round of applause to thank, thank them for all the support. So if you have a project that you're not sure if you want to transfer or donate to Linear Foundation Europe, do it. <laughs> it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Preston. And uh, as he said, the... <laughs> Is a, indeed, he's a project host at the Linux Foundation, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Now we continue with projects, because I would like to welcome on the stage Manuel Rego, who is going to present his project on a servo server, isn't it? So this is incredible. So thank you. <laughs> OK, yeah, so yeah, I'm, this is servo, basically. I mean, the uh, mini browser we have, so I'm going to use it to, to do the presentation. So yeah. Uh, for those that doesn't know the project, Servo is yeah, an embeddable independent, memory safe, modular parallel web browser engine. So like you could think on Chromium or WebKit or Gecko. So Servo is, is one written in Rust. I'm Manuel Rego. I work at Igalia, where we have a lot of experience with the web platform. And we have been taking over the maintenance of Servo for the last couple of years. So this is going to be an update on the, yeah, the last year since the last Member Summit, this is a video of yeah, the servo, uh, servo shell application browsing in the servo.org website. You can see that many things start to work, not like last year. So we have flexible support, things like that. So the, it looks like a regular uh, browser. I mean, we don't have still uh, YouTube support, but still uh, many things work. And this is going out to uh, even uh, go to the Wikipedia page, and you will see how, how it looks. We have been doing a lot of progress, implementing lots of features. So. Yeah, now it starts to, to render yeah, many more things and, and work better. So yeah, like if we focus on the work we have been doing, a lot of communication work to make people aware that service is not dead anymore, because for a couple of years it was kind of dead. So like a lot of monthly blog posts that have made too many <laughs> popular websites. We are doing weekly updates for a while in Mastodon and Twitter, and we have been giving talks in many events. There is having a new one coming in the Ubuntu Summit, like in a month or so. So I mean, a lot of, of talks to spread the word about the project. And we can see how the project has been growing this last couple of years. If we check like some numbers of these stats, for the people that don't know the history of the project, uh, it started by Mozilla when they were starting with the Rust language and Servo as a proof of concept for it. But then in 2020, Mozilla laid off the whole team and donated it to Linux Foundation. 
And for a couple of years, there were no, almost no activity on the project. And yeah, Igalia took over the maintenance in January last year. And yeah, since then, we have been growing the project a lot. Like you see, we have grown, like, I mean, like number of comments this year is almost a double than last year. And like we have now 100 contributors, of course, not all of them. I mean, these are unique contributors during the whole year, but we have like a 20 active contributors working on the project at this point, so it's a quite active project. At the same time, yeah, it's still very popular. It has been very popular since the beginning in Servo, and it's still like, I mean, we just check the GitHub stars, and it's going up and up, and we have passed like 25,000, so it's like, yeah, people really like Servo. <laughs> So, yeah, we have set up donations on, on Open Collective and GitHub sponsored this year. We got more than 350 people, probably now. This is from last week, probably now it's 370 or 80, I don't know. We get donations every day, and it's like, yeah, I think it's now $17,000 that we have reached so far, but yeah, that's also great. And yeah, about the new features and new things, like Servo works on Windows, Linux, and Mac, but also we are adding new platforms. We have Android support now and Open Harmony also. Uh, yeah, for Android support, you can also go to the server website, download the APK and install. It's not yet in stores because it's experimental, but it's still the Open Harmony is being added right now. And a good thing that happened also during this year is that some projects started to use or experiment with Servo. So first thing was with Tauri. We were working together. Tauri is a Rust UI framework, and they were yeah, they use like the system web view usually, and they were doing an experiment using Servo underneath to render the, the, the applications. Then there was also yeah, some experiments like this split from the Ioxus Labs that yeah, they are using parts of Servo, a module that is called Stylo, which also Firefox use to get the styles and CSS and all that, and being able to, to render websites also. There was also experiment uh, Qt Web View that is a grab in Qt around the Servo project, so you can also use it to render things if you have a Qt application. And there is this project called Verso that is like exploratory uh, browser uh, on top of Servo, so basically it's a new browser. I mean, it's of course just a pet project in a sense now, just a, a URL bar and not a lot of things, but basically exploring how to create a browser using Servo underneath. So there are yeah, a momentum being grown here. And, and yeah, like about features we have been working on. We have this servo shell, I'm using it now uh, to render things. We have lots of progress in HTML and CSS support. I mean, like C for CSS support, uh, servo has a new layout engine that was started when Mozilla were laying off the team. And yeah, like when we started working on it, it was like around 40% of pass rate of the CSS test suite. And now we are uh, almost in 70, not yet, but percent. So it's like growing a lot. We also have. I mean, there are people working on the community on WebXR support, Gamepad API, DevTools have been bring back, so you can use DevTools for when you are yeah, working on Servo also. So yeah, many, many things that happened during this year. And just like taking a look to the future, I mean, like we think that Servo can actually be a web engine for the future. It has some very good things. It's independent. It has open governance at the Linux Foundation Europe, and it doesn't depend on any main company or main actor behind it. Like the TSC has people from different companies and yeah, just join regularly every month and discuss the, yeah, the roadmap of the project or the different tasks and all that. It's a performance. It's the only engine that is using parallelization for web content. I mean, that was one of the goals of the project since the beginning, to be parallel and use as much parallelization as possible. Thank you to the Rust language. And it's the only, neither Chromium or WebKit or Gecko are using parallelization for web content. And it's secure because it's the only one using Rust. I mean, Rust prevents a lot of memory vulnerabilities and all that. So it has very good strong points. And yeah, how we can get there to be in the engine of the future? We need to grow a healthy ecosystem. We are on the process. And of course, the project is growing. So it seems we are getting results. But yeah, more people, more organizations should join a fourth. So yeah, we will need several organizations and, and people joining a fourth. And of course, we need money to make that happen. So public and pri private funding will be very needed in the, in the future to keep growing the project and, and being able to, to be a potential alternative. And then like we have good, very good opportunities. It can be used for simple applications when you control what you're rendering. I'm using it now for a Reveal.js presentation here. And yeah, I mean, it works. So it can be used already for that. It can be like the, the engine for some UI frameworks. We were talking about Tauri or Dioxus and that kind of things 
They are popular Rust UI frameworks and it can be the engine behind them. And ideally, in a few years, we could be like the default web engine. When you have a Rust application, if you need to render web content, why use Chromium or WebKit? I mean, you could just use Rust and you will have, I mean, your server and you will have a full Rust stack on that side. So yeah. And yeah, of course, join the project. I mean, uh, you have here the links to everything. I mean, we have the booth today here. We were also in the Igalia booth at the Open Source Summit. So yeah, I mean, you know how to find us. Just talk to us and, and yeah, we want to grow this even further. And yeah, that's all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, first question, and I'm gonna do this in reverse, since everybody's been sitting and after lunch, everybody's going to sleep. Uh, let's do uh, reverse hands up, which means everybody starts with their hands up. Come on, it'll, it, it'll be fun. <laughs> now, put your hand down if you uh, have not heard of RISC-V. So, okay, everybody kind of knows. Put your arm down if you actually know what RISC-V is. I kind of got the logic on that right, maybe I got it backwards. <laughs> All right, so, uh, how, about if, how many of you have heard of RISE and know what we're doing with this? A few, okay, well it looks like I'm in the right place then. So. Um, I just want to do a quick introduction of RISE, talk about who the members are. I think, I know you know what RISE is. Can I lower No. All right. <laughs> yes, you can. Um, we'll talk uh, a little bit about the, uh, the relationship between RISE and RISC-V International, the standards organization within um, LFUS that, uh, that uh, handles all of the, uh, the RISE instruction set architecture. We'll talk about some of the ecosystem contributions that RISE has done so far and how to get involved. So what is RISE? People ask me this all the time because uh, there's already a RISC-V international organization. What is RISE up to? Um, RISE is a separate organization that is focused solely on uh, enhancing and improving the RISC-V software ecosystem. Uh, this is necessary because RISC-V is a brand new hardware architecture and it doesn't actually do anything interesting unless you have software to run on it. And um, while there has been a tremendous outpouring of software support from the open source community and from individual companies who are building uh, RISC-V processors, there are definitely some notable gaps and particularly notable places for optimization. And so um, for the last 18 months, mostly what, RISC what RISE has been doing is both funding and providing upstream support for optimization in the software ecosystem. And uh, that's what we're going to continue to do, and I'll show you the working groups in which this all happens. Um, I don't remember how, how much time we've got here. Um, these are the current members of RISE. The 13 up here are the ones who started the organization in May of last year, and you can see all these other new organizations have joined since then. Um, and uh, it's a great group. I mean, it is very, very vibrant. If you go to, go to some of these working groups, we'll have 30 or 40 people on the line and, and they're very, very active. Uh, it's been a, a really fantastic uh, uh, collaborative operation with all of these companies, many of whom are, com are competitors with each other. So um, uh, RISC-V, of course, is a standard hardware architecture with clear open standards, and that's what RISC-V International does. Uh, RISE is uh, working on building a thriving open source software ecosystem. And uh, this is where we come together. Uh, we have uh, regular uh, in interlock interaction meetings with RISC-V International on a regular basis. And um, we speak at many conferences and are, try to create a, a presence for software in this very hardware-driven universe. And uh, it's been very positive. So these are the focus areas that we've been working on. Uh, there's, there are working groups around all of these, and you can actually go and take a look at all of the minutes and see what uh, is going on on the wiki. There's a link down there at the bottom that most of you probably can't see. It's just wiki.riseproject.dev. And uh, uh, in particular, the optimizations around uh, LLVM and GCC, I think, and, and all other uh, toolchain components, I think are the most interesting and, and relevant because uh, without those tool chains, it kind of makes it very hard to build some of these other pieces of software. Uh, we've got kernel and virtualization working group, uh, system libraries. Uh, Red Hat actually helps to run the Linux distro integration uh, uh, working group, although it's not all Linux. Um, Tizen is also in there. 
I don't think it's on this page, but there is a Tizen working group that Samsung participates in. Um, we work on simulators and emulators for Kimu, Spike, uh, system software. So we try to do the entire stack. And one of the questions that came up earlier that I wanted to also to answer uh, was, uh, do, are we just focused on MCU class hardware? Are we just focused on higher performance application style hardware? And the answer is everything. Where we find the gaps is uh, the way these get prioritized is through the operation of the technical steering committee. It is all done in committee and it's done through consensus. And so uh, that makes part of what makes it such a vibrant community is that everybody, as people go into it with an agreement about what to work on. This is what we have sort of accomplished over the last 18 months. We started with eight working groups. We now have 10. Uh, we started with 13 original companies. We now have 21 that are all contributing time and money. And um, the way this money gets spent, uh, we do spend a little bit on coming to events. Uh, but mostly what we spend this money on is uh, going back out into the ecosystem and funding work. So uh, if you have an idea about something that needs to be done and you have a, a specific plan on how it can be done, you can submit a, a, an RFP or a, submit a, a request through the TSC and then an RFP can be generated by the, and it can go out for bid and um, um, that's been really useful. Uh, actually, I misspoke that. We actually have over one million euros in place currently for contracts in the oh, wow. RFP program. <laughs> Um, many of them are for significantly more than 100K on their own. And uh, you can, I can even go show you some of them. If you look on the, on the t there's an RFP section on the wiki here that uh, outlines all of the different RFPs that are currently going on, because you can kind of see what has been prioritized for the work that we're paying for. Um, and this is on top of the work that the working groups do, because each of the organizations in, within RISE also contributes uh, one or two developers who just work on RISC-V software. But you can see toolchain things there, uh, Kimu, uh, LLVM, and GCC improvements. Uh, uh, LibJPEG Turbo was something that didn't exist in the, the, uh, the uh, RISC-V universe before this. Um, optimizing H.264. So you can see it kind of goes across the board, and part of it is what people are willing to work on, part of it is what we are willing to fund. And we try to really focus on the things that haven't been done yet. Uh, if there's something that is already en route, we, don't want, we, would, we'd be, we would love to, uh, to supplement that. But uh, there's only so many things that we can pay for all at once, unless we have more members and more money at hand, in which case, this is where you guys come in. If you would like to learn how to join rise and how to, to uh, become part of this organization, uh, just let me know. If it's something where you're like, well, I really would like to just work on RISC-V software and uh, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing so with the best practices, come and talk to us. We can, uh, I can put you in touch with the TSC folks who are doing that. And you don't necessarily have to join RISE in that case because all of the work that we do goes upstream. So if you're working upstream and RISC-V software, you're helping out the RISE community and the RISC-V community and the entire open source community. So that was all I had. Does anybody have any questions? I answered everybody's questions. Wow, that's never happened before. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Super, super, super interesting and definitely an example of success of open source project. Moving on. Multitasking also. <laughs> it's uh, my pleasure to present uh, Guillaume Nevicato, who's going to be talking a little bit about Silva. Hello. So uh, my objective today is to give you, uh, um, yeah, an update status on, on Silva. We were here last year, so. I will mainly cover what's happened this year. So I'll just introduce myself, uh, Guillaume Nevicato. I'm working at Orange, and I'm one of the two TSC Silva co-chair. The other one is Carlo Cavazzoni from Telecom Italia. And in the room, you have many partners also of Silva with uh, um, Telefonica, Self-Focus, Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia. So. Uh, uh, a great presence of uh, LF Europe members here about this project. <coughs> and uh, so just for whom who doesn't know Silva, uh, 
Who knows Silva in this uh, room? Yeah, we can to be <laughs> more and more popular. So for whom who are not knowing Silva, the main objective uh, is to limit the fragmentation of the cloud native infrastructure in Europe for telco purposes. It means about Kubernetes to host the 5G, um, the fixed network, and so on. So we have two main pillars in the project. The first one is to deliver software, running software, production-grade software. Uh, and the second one is to boost the adoption of this telco cloud stack. So we have a validation center and a validation program led by Luis Velarde from Telefonica here. And here we are testing lots of network functions and in the future lots of edge application, AI applications. So this is our target. Uh, the project has been launched two years ago. So happy birthday, Silva. Um, no, it's our second year. Uh, we've got 58 active developers. Uh, some are full-time developers. Main, lots of are full-time developers. So it's, it's great for this community. We have many followers in Slack that are using the, the stack, that are testing the stack, university, industrial. We have many feedback. Uh, now we have, uh, after two years, 26 comp active, active companies that are contributing to the project. It's, only, it's not only coding and have uh, some uh, git push and so on in the code, but it's also testing uh, the solution uh, for the network functions that, uh, that are testing the, 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 the stack. It's also integrators that are deploying the stack in their customers, so we have an overall ecosystem. Uh, and what's important is that uh, this year, Silva now is going to production, and I think it's really important that open source software goes in live and uh, have critical functions. We already integrate all the 5G requirements into the stack, which is uh, um, one of the most difficult use cases we have to handle. And uh, um, with Velarde, with his validation uh, work group, uh, they have validated already 10 different network functions from many kinds of vendors, so the, the biggest one. So we have uh, a, a good progress uh, this year. So I will just come back on what has been this year. So last September during the Open Source Summit, uh, you, you've got uh, Nicola Homo from Orange with uh, Arpit Yashipura from the Ninex Foundation uh, networking. We, we officialized the fact that uh, Silvano will have a directed fund, uh, so it will allow us to boost the project. In October, uh, we were at the Network X event. It's uh, an important uh, event uh, in the telco industry where we have uh, a small scene with uh, 2,000 people, and uh, it was the opportunity to promote the, the project. Uh, we have made some uh, uh, early testing. I mentioned 5G core, but there are uh, another complex use case in the telco world. It's uh, the open RAN, how we can have a uh, disaggregated uh, radio access network. And so we have made uh, some early testing with uh, a community which is the Open RAN Alliance. For January, we have some official good news about uh, that uh, many contributors of Silva, you, you have the, the green cloud here that are, that are benefiting from, uh, from the European Commission with, uh, with a large investment. So it allows us to uh, contribute in open source and to hire developers and to accelerate the, the, the development of, of a project. Uh, during February, it was uh, a key momentum because we, we had our first V1 release. We were before on alpha, beta. Now we have a release that, we, that is production grade and we have the sufficient level of quality with some uh, uh, CI testing and so on that demonstrate that we can go in live, in production. And by the way, uh, this is one of... Uh, um, of the main event in, uh, in, in our sector, which is the Mobile World Congress. We have been selected uh, um, and we win, uh, we, we won the best cloud solution at the, as at, to, we had this award and we were very proud to, to, to have it. 
So uh, uh, we, we, it, it was a, a boost for, for, for us because we were only starting, but it's not the end of the year. I have some <laughs> other good news after. Um, having good software is important, but also it's to, to build a community. Lucian mentioned this, and I think it's, it's very key for, for our future. We had our first uh, Silva Dev Days in, in Paris with uh, 70 uh, senior developers, but also new developers. So we organized some task force rooms where uh, senior developers were explaining some topic about security, about energy efficiency, about how you manage Kubernetes at scale, and so on. So we, we, ha we have many uh, different rooms to, to, to manage uh, those priority of the project. And it was uh, really beneficial. Lucian mentioned that uh, it gave us also lots of energy. And I think it's important, uh, that kind of event, to, uh, to, to boost uh, uh, the, the project. Uh, and then in, in July, we, 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 we have more and more uh, production um, sites uh, across Europe and also uh, in the African zone. And, Today, um, we released a paper, uh, Linux Foundation released a paper, but a use case study where we are, we've got a testimonial of what we are doing in production with, with Silva. So uh, we started the year in February with the V1, and now we, are, we have some testimony about uh, many countries that are deploying Silva in production for critical use cases. And last but not least, I was not here this morning neither uh, Luis Velarde, why? We had the first Silva Mini Summit uh, just after the Open Source Summit, um, and it was the opportunity also to explain the project for potential uh, new operators, vendors, uh, integrators that are very keen to, to onboard on this project. If you have any question, we are here with uh, André Vieira from Self Focus. He was on, on the booth with Velarde, with, uh, with our partners, Huawei, uh, Nokia, and Ericsson, if you want to have more information. We are here to, to, to answer to your questions. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Guillaume. I think that Silva really represents uh, one of those uh, projects that are successful, are an example for the open source community in Europe. And I really appreciate that you mentioned that uh, the community is super important and there are different entry points to contribute to the project. Moving on, another excellent project to present. Well, well that was still <laughs> Silva. <laughs> is the Zebri project presented by Kate Stewart. Thank you very much. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm the VP of Dependable Embedded Systems at the Linux Foundation, and Zephyr was the second project I was asked to look over when I joined, after I joined the Linux Foundation. And so we've been growing this project right from the start. The heart of Zephyr's developer community is here in Europe. Okay, you'll actually see pre pretty dominant in some of the contributions. Um, so in that sense, it's pretty relevant to talk about. But what we've been doing with Zephyr, for, quick show, how many of her, have, has everyone heard of Zephyr in this room? Yay. Oh, there's some, there's some no hands up. Okay, fine. Well, so basically Zephyr's an RTOS. It is not Linux. Linux doesn't get smaller than three meg. However, for sensors and actuators, you need something that can go bigger. Go, go from the 10K and go up. You want to be very mindful of the footprint. And so when we started looking around for an RTOS to basically consolidate on and do best security and safety practices, um, we started with this code base uh, that Intel donated into the project and we had three initial members and this was back in 2016. And since then, um, we have now, um, CNCF does a lovely job of summarizing everything uh, every year in the project velocity across the Linux Foundation projects is one aspect. And um, as of this summer, we were number four with the Linux Foundation, okay? So we're sitting about 2.6 commits per hour in this code base. And the reason we've been able to do this is we've been following best practices. And we learned a lot from Linux and we've applied it. So anyone who is starting to look at um, growing your projects, uh, looking at some of the lessons of removing barriers for developers and listening to the developers tends to make things go forward and keeping things neutral. So um, 
As you can see, our average commits per month has been going up steadily compared to the other RTOSs out there. And we are able to do security best practices and we are going after safety certifications with this project now. And like I say, the code base was initially came from, the code base initially came from um, some satellite work that was done and that um, Wind River had acquired and was mostly on the shelf. And then uh, Intel, when Intel had acquired Wind River, they took this and they wanted a neutral starting point. And so this is how it all started up. But as you can sort of see, Nordic is our number one contributor here. And then we have um, various other Europeans participants coming into here pretty dominantly. But what we did to do, make this happen is we, in 2016, 2017, there was a report coming out about the Linux kernel and best practices for open source. And this was about the time that the project started. And we really took this to heart. So we basically made sure that we um, used a lot of the best practices. And this did pay off in the long run. It doesn't pay off short term, but you have to basically be there and be sustained, and it will pay off. Um, and so we've been putting out LTSs, and we are in a fairly good shape at this point. We came up with this model right at the very start of the project because that 2.6 commits per hour is not something you want to base a product on. So we looked at a lesson from the Linux kernel, we created with an LTS, and every two years we put out a new LTS, and that's something we hold stable, and we do security backports and fixes to it so that people can make products on it, and then if they've got products and they let us know, we we will basically tell them any security fixes under embargo. So we have a full embargo policy and we've been working with it from that perspective. And so this vulnerability embargo policy is key for keeping things secure for IoT. We also have communicate, you know, we also have encryption on the communications. We have a lot of other security techniques that are being used in the project. But we've actually been an open source project that has been a CVE numbering authority, so we're managing our own vulnerabilities since 2017. And we're starting to work on some self-assestation stuff for things. We are actually one of the fifth, I think we're the fifth project at the Linux, the fifth project overall to attain, obtain the OpenSSF's um, gold badge for best practices. And we use this to shape our security team practices, quite frankly. Following going after the, um, basically the passing and then silver and then gold, we'll take your project through um, good practices for an open source project. And so I would encourage any project to look, who's looking at trying to improve their security posture to do this as well, because it certainly has paid off for us. And then the other thing is we've actually been generating SBOM since 2021. In fact, every time you do a build, if you turn the options on, you get three SBOMs. You get one for the sources of Zephyr, one for the sources of the apps, and a build SBOM that links back to those source ones and is very precise about exactly what is in your ELF image, which removes a whole class of false positives. Okay, so if you had a version of Zephyr, you can actually say, is this file there or not? Because security vulnerabilities happen at the file level. And if it's not, the file isn't present, you don't have the vulnerability and you need to be authoritative. Therefore, we've been doing this and we're working our way forward. Um, and we're, you know, this sort of thing's gone. We've gone through some security audits external security audits by NCC Group. The first one basically made us revise our processes because they found a bunch of stuff. The most recent one, um, they found a couple minor things, but that we, and we funded that. The project funded them to do the audit. So I think we were pretty good there. And our practices continue to evolve. Um, you know, we are continuing to align with whatever's happening upstream with the MBD day structures and so forth. Um, we are basically doing more and more work. We're working with a European company called um, Bugsang to integrate in scanning into um, uh, uh, along, aligning with our coding guidelines into the code base. And then, you know, we're basically helping others um, to on-ramp the security best practices and keep evolving security. And so, you know, the OpenSSF scorecards is something we're actually working on right now too, to have the wider security posture outside the code base, but actually for the project level. And so that's going on. And then what we're trying to do right now is to basically go after uh, vModel uh, type safety engineering. Okay, we're trying to take an open source project through uh, safety assessment that will be useful, um, that can be plugged into system management. And so we're focusing initially on 61508, and then um, we are pretty much gonna be able to go after 262 next year as well, is what we're probably looking at. Um, we are taking um, and doing a lot of the requirement 
creation, as well as the open traceability out in the open. But there will be things that are reserved for members um, to help, because they're the ones who are paying for this work at the end of the day, um, for our safety manual and so forth. This, the initial certification focus will just be the kernel portion. But we are doing this methodology out in the open so that others can see how to do it and extend from there beyond. And so we are in our, we're waiting to get our phase one written assessment back. Um, we've submitted the materials, so we're hoping within the next few weeks we'll, we should see our phase one assessment in written form. And then we will just basically be working on our phase two with two sued. So we have a contract in place and we've, we've been working on that. And we actually, have, the project has hired a functional safety manager to work with us to make sure we get all these artifacts lined up effectively for audit. So the results um, of this work, we have a very active and growing community, as you can see by the uh, number of participants and contributors. There's over 750 boards in our repo at this point in time, okay? This is all out in the open, so there's a pretty good chance if you want to use um, one of the smaller boards and want to work on things, there's probably a staff report there, or there'll be something that's close out there at this point. Um, it supports all the major architectures, RISC-V, uh, ARM, and um, like I say, a wide things. And I'm pleased to report that um, as of last month, Zephyr is back in space. It actually is now on the Deimos um, satellite from Ethero. And so Ethero and AntMicro were collaborating on it. And um, like I say, the Zephyr is a reference port of Zephyr is sitting in there in order to enable up the FPGA. So it, it sits there and runs in the harsh environment because it doesn't take a lot of power. And then when it, certain signal conditions are met, it basically brings up a, an FPGA array to do further processing in AI and analysis on that one. And then, you know, it runs on things like, um, you know, the monitoring rings that have to last for a week or pet trackers. Or quite frankly, if you have a hearing aid um, from Oticon, it's running Zephyr right now. Um, it's also in wind turbines. So where power is a constraint and you know, resources are constraints, we're seeing Zephyr nice, being a nice solution when they can't use Linux. Oh, and I, I guess I should have said that, yeah, all of this year's Google Chromebooks are running Zephyr as their firmware. So if you've got a Google Chromebook, it's running Zephyr. And the open framework laptop um, that we had uh, one on display over in the other event, um, that's running Zephyr too. And then, you know, hobbyist keyboards, um, monitoring watches, like I say, we are seeing a, a wide range of uh, processors and applications, some of which include AI, like this best pump monitoring is being used on Deutsche Bahn's railway systems to empty out the waste trap, wastewater tanks and make sure they empty properly. And anyone who's taken the, um, Trains here in Europe, we want to keep our bathrooms working, right? It's a very important job, so we need to have it going. Um, and then, you know, the smart waste. So it's, it's not being used in the big flashy places, but it's being used in ways that make people's lives better. And so in, in that sense, it's quite, it's quite fun for me. And so if anyone is interested in getting involved, oops, we've had a little shift on that, but okay. Um, the Zephyr project's there, it's open. Um, and the community hangs out mostly on the Discord. And if anyone's interested in becoming a member, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Definitely a success, uh, definitely as an open source project and also as a community. And talking about community, I welcome on the stage the last two speakers. They're going to be talking about the CNCF. But I'm going to leave the stage to them, to Bob Killen and Daniel Crook. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Crook, and I'm responsible for uh, maintainer happiness at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. With these, with my, my colleague Bob Killen. Hey. He just joined us from uh, Google recently, and he's been in the Kubernetes community for for quite a while. And he's a senior te a senior technical project manager for us. Okay. So if you're not familiar with the CNCF, uh, it was originally established in 2015 uh, to host Kubernetes. Uh, it's now expanded to host a whole ecosystem of other cloud-native projects, uh, things that are focused on containers, serverless computing, WASM, and it's also been a, along a platform of choice for, for building and deploying AI applications. Uh, in a nutshell, our mission is to make cloud-native computing ubiquitous, um, and that is we want to make sure that the best practices for modern software development are adopted and strengthened worldwide. Uh, for another perspective, uh, Kelsey Hightower recently called us the Netflix of the cloud world. Um, 
from that point of view, uh, we're, we're essentially a home to the creators and a channel for the innovators of the world um, with a, a huge and growing community of projects that are part of our ecosystem. Um, so beyond the core staff at the Linux Foundation, um, the CNCF is part of the Linux Foundation, probably the largest foundation within it. Uh, we host nearly 200 projects. Uh, over 200 now. Over 200. Yeah, we can, it's hard to keep it's up. It's 212. 212, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we have to update the slide yet again today. Um, so we host over, over 200 projects um, with about 1,000 maintainers and a community of about 250,000 contributors from around the world. Uh, so those 200 projects, they lie in a distribution of sandbox, incubating, and graduated categories. And that represents the maturity, the production readiness, and those map to the distribution described in the book, uh, Crossing the Chasm, if you're familiar with that. Uh, it has a model for technology adoption. Um, so we've got sandbox really at the beginning, incubating projects are, are maturing, having diverse committers, and finally um, production grade graduated projects. So uh, to tell you more about project maturity, where we stand with these projects, I'll hand it over to Bob. Okay. So the CNCF really continues to grow rapidly. Um, this year alone, we've accepted you know, 21 more sandbox projects. Um, and our existing projects honestly continue to flourish. We've had over 40 advanced and maturity like over the past year in one shape or another. Um, now back to that, you know, whole Netflix analogy, we've also had some sort of cancellations or, you know, we've had five projects that have been archived this year. Um, going beyond projects, uh, we've also done a lot more in the end user space and launched the end user technical advisory board uh, last year at KubeCon North America. Um, this end user group is meant to provide a unified voice for users to provide you know, feedback to the CNCF projects, um, mainly around usability, reliability, performance, but most importantly, you know, what gaps exist in the ecosystem. It's these gaps are you know, areas that our projects either need to consider or potentially it's a place for you know, a new project to enter uh, the ecosystem and join as a sandbox project to cover that identified gap. Um, the tab is a group that's like composed mostly of like our platinum end user members, elected silver and gold members. We have some that are also elected by the end user community as a whole. <clears throat> Sorry. And a few are appointed by our uh, technical oversight committee. Uh, this ensures that we have, you know, a diverse set of representatives uh, that can provide, you know, insights from an equally diverse set of you know, views and needs. And it's also not about you know, industry diversity, but geodiversity. We, uh, five of the 11 TAB members are from Europe, and um, our other members are from you know, the United States and India. They can all surface some of the you know, different geopolitical needs in more like you know, different compliance and security needs and things of that nature. Um, the TAB, when it was founded, had three initiatives they wanted to cover. Um, first, they have uh, reference architecture, which is honestly the number one ask from our users They've for, for years. Um, essentially, it's to provide some guidance or like a reference on building a cloud-native platform. Um, and if you're familiar with the CNCF landscape, it's no surprise that many are unsure of what or how to use uh, these things on their stack. Um, so now the CNCF uh, is like, we are not in the business of making kingmakers. So the best way we thought to go about doing something like this is to you know, create a platform for the users to share sort of their stories around their stack. They're encouraged, they're encouraged, yeah, sorry, they're encouraged to share not only their wins, but also you know, the bumps along the way that they've had, the, the things that they've had to tape together, or you know, the, the various scripts they've had to write a bunch of bash scripts to, to you know, fix the, the in-between, because that's really the knowledge that helps people you know, really adopt this stuff. Um, and all these stories are grouped into domains or reference architectures such as, you know, AIML batch, platform engineering, CICD, uh, and others. Um, we are uh, hoping to launch this by KubeCon and Salt Lake City later this year um, once we've collected enough submissions. Also, I'm sorry, this is sort of lengthy descriptions, but it, it helps cover it all. <laughs> the, the second issue is focused on uh, feedback loops. Uh, between projects and users. 
Um, of the 200 ish projects in the CNCF ecosystem, there are many more repos. Kubernetes has close to 400 repos alone, and those are all managed by different you know, sort of subsets of maintainers. And all of them have different methods that they kind of want to engage with users around you know, feedback. So like, it's, it's very hard for people to like, navigate that, especially for more than one project. Um, so we have this initiative that sort of like provides a common way uh, for users to interact with maintainers and provide this feedback in a way that allows maintainers to basically continue to work and function like they normally do in GitHub uh, while uh, being able to connect with end users. Um, this is currently in a POC uh, with tab, the tab and a few projects. Uh, once the workflow gets sort of solidified, it'll get automated and be more widely available. Uh, the last initiative is Project Health, and this has been a partnership with uh, the TOC, um, the CNCF staff, and the LFX team as we've identified some like key metrics that can be used to identify project health. <clears throat> For the TOC, this is so that way they can you know, try and uh, get involved early if they see a project in a decline to potentially you know, raise a uh, red flag like, hey, this project needs you know, more engagement if you are using it, here's a good opportunity for you to get engaged. And for the tab and the end users, it's for them to make you know, more informed decisions regarding the risk and, uh, and you know, what they want to adopt and whether you know, it's worth it for them to, to get involved. Like, if you need to, is it better to get involved in a project that has a whole lot of maintainers and things are good, or a project that is, you know, that's critical to your stack and you know, hurting for maintainers? So it helps them make those more informed decisions. Well, with a note on health, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, great, thank you, Bob. Um, so one of the tools we use that is available to all other Linux Foundation projects, and you saw Kate showed a couple of uh, screenshots from it too, is the new LFX Insights platform. And it's been a way to highlight of that huge community of projects, um, their current health, the productivity, the trends that are going on. Um, and it's a key part of what the Linux Foundation is doing in general to become more data-driven about all these amazing initiatives that are, that are happening not, within, not only within the CNCF, but across the ELF. Uh, so we've got over 99% of our CNCF projects in Insights. And it's a, it's a great way to click through, find out about um, certain projects, how fast they're growing, if you're an end user, if you're a potential developer or contributor. Uh, there's also a great view to see the geographic distribution and diversity of each of our products, our projects. So here in the case of Kyverno, uh, we can see that we have a project here that has a large community of European contributors that when combined are actually larger than the, uh, the US and India contributor base. Uh, and you can see it's, it's accepting developers from and con contributions around the world. Okay, so projects are the main focus of the CNCF, uh, but there's lots of other initiatives the CNCF runs, uh, one of which is the flagship KubeCon Cloud Native Con. Uh, we run events around the world, one in each geography a year. And the bit we just hosted six months ago, the biggest one ever in Paris, uh, with 12,000 attendees, uh, with from folks across Europe as well as the world uh, represented there. Uh, beyond those flagship KubeCons, we also support many smaller regional events all over Europe and the world. Um, on this continent alone, we've had uh, eight KCDs that have happened, and there's uh, four coming up this fall already. So we really enc um, encourage you, if you're not able to travel to one of the larger events, uh, look for something local. Get involved in your community, um, in your own city, in your own country. Okay, so beyond the projects, beyond events, Another big pillar of what we do is training and certification, and that is growing fast. Uh, Paris was the launching point for a new program uh, to recognize the experts, the technical experts in our community. Uh, there are five certifications somebody can get to learn about Kubernetes and cloud native technologies. And if you pass all five of those tests, uh, you are one of our newly minted Cube astronauts. And in fact, we have one here in, uh, in Stefan right here. <laughs> And we're probably going to see about 1,000 around the world um, by the end of the year. But uh, really excited um, uh, with the nice jacket we were able to give him to recognize that contribution. OK, if you were at Open Source Summit earlier this week, uh, you may have heard about a brand new member benefit program, uh, which is in partnership with Unified Patents. Uh, this partnership offers a strong defense against patent trolls who are trying to use weak IP claims against open source. 
Uh, they go after individual companies, large and small. And really the goal here with this partnership is to form a united uh, way to, to defend open source from those who um, are bad actors against it. So uh, we encourage you to check out Unified Patents there. It's a key member benefit, a uh, brand new thing that we're offering. Okay, so looking forward to next year. Uh, we announced already our next KubeCon in Europe, and that's going to be at London. Um, it, the CFP is already open. <laughs> the CFP, yeah, the call for papers for folks to participate. The sponsorship prospectus is there as well. Um, and, you know, not to make any regional, you know, rivalries, but um, if you are from that area, maybe you want to try to go for more than 12,000 attendees and break the record of KubeCon. Um, and if you're, you know, Dutch as well, I heard a Dutchie earlier. Um, in 2026, we have another KubeCon on the schedule already uh, scheduled for Amsterdam. Um, and if you're not already a member, um, we, we really want you to get involved, whether you're a contributor, an individual contributor, a company. Um, and please talk to Robert Reeves in the back there. Um, Robert's uh, waving his hand uh, to talk about any sort of questions you have about membership or um, any of those great benefits we talked about for both your projects and your company. So with that, um, enjoy the rest of the day. I think we were the last talk, yep. so hopefully you can enjoy. Um, Only run, running slightly over time. Oh, slightly over time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, thanks Thanks. So much.